Kia ora koutou, Marky here. So, uh, welcome to the channel if you're new, and welcome back if you're a friend and subscriber. So, I am a psychotherapist, and I specialise in something called retroactive jealousy, uh, among other things. I have a, a cluster of uh, specialisms, and this channel, uh, channel's purpose is to get information out to people that suffer with this and their partners who suffer just as much uh, to help them recover but we don't just do videos on retroactive jealousy uh, for various reasons which I talk about in other videos we do other stuff as well and one of the things that I got into a good while back was looking at uh, song lyrics that I thought really uh, beautifully express uh, or, or describe or illustrate certain psychological conditions or maybe just the human condition and analyzing them and looking at them and using them as, as a kind of a launch pad for talking a little bit about that condition as well and then sometimes i just strayed into talking about uh song lyrics that i really liked as well so uh if you're interested in some of the others and if you if you like the sisters of mercy and this is what has drawn you here um i have done uh videos on some of the other bands that were popular at the time that, that, that came from the same stable if you like as or have overlaps with the sisters of mercy so the mission and uh all about eve i've done um done a few uh, quite a few uh, videos about all about Eve and uh, two about the mission now so they're all on playlists so check them out and have a little look okay so Alice now Alice is one of the pre-album Sisters of Mercy songs so uh, isn't uh, there are all these or a lot of these songs are now on a compilation um, called a slight case of over over bombing um, but but they came out before before the actual album. So so there was an album called First and Last and Always, uh, and it was the last for that lineup. Um, and um, before that, there was a whole bunch of singles and EPs and B sides and and stuff like that. And although I love the album and I love the the other albums um, by Sisters of Mercy, I really love. The pre-album stuff and the two songs that that I love the most are Temple of Love and Alice, uh, and apparently they were the ones that they put the money into, um, the put the, for for better production quality. Um, so you can listen to to all the, you know these original pre-album songs, uh, and they're great. I like them, but they're 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 kind of you know the production isn't um, of the you know the highest standard that you know that they came to enjoy later in the sisters of mercy journey um but alice is and temple of love is and i just I, alice is just such a it just means so much to me or you know there was a club that i used to go to that played all this kind of stuff and you know when that song came on you know i'm not always a a, a dancer because i have dyspraxia um but um you know i would love dancing to that um so i mean that's the one thing about that, this style of music you know I, I like to call it um goth uh not everybody does that's a contentious thing um but it was kind of rock music that you can dance to um which is a fine thing i think really um now just just on the subject of goth um andrew eldritch who is the sisters of mercy really he's continued it he's the only consistent kind of band member of of the sisters of mercy uh again i suppose that's a controversial statement but um he uh gets very grumpy when uh the word goth comes along as oh when he says things like oh we're not a goth band we just um we we just had a phase and you know people call me goth because i, I wear black socks it's ridiculous but Eldritch is not his real name. <laughs> I can't remember what his real name is. He changed his name to, you know, stage name is is Eldritch. Now, um, Eldritch is almost synonymous with Gothic, you know, um, or certainly the two words would go together. You know, you, you could, um, you know, a lot of things that are Gothic are also Eldritch. So I don't think, Andrew, <laughs> you, you can get away with denying, you know, and saying, well, you know, not understanding or, or being kind of annoyed by people calling you goth when you actually uh, change your name to Eldridge. So that, there we go. Um, not that Andrew Eldridge will be listening. Um, I've got another video waiting in the wings as well, in which I'm going to refer to the psychology of Andrew Eldridge. So watch out for, for that one. So, okay, Alice. So, um, 
Now, where shall I start? Should we start with the lyrics or should we start with the psychology? So first of all, apologies for the, uh, I'm, I'm pointing my iPhone, which is how I make these videos, because it's a low tech channel. We're a neurodiverse channel. Um, we do things in the moment, spontaneously, um, and there's no presentation quality whatsoever. Uh, on this channel. So I'm pointing my iPhone at my computer screen and uh, you're probably getting that horrible jazzing effect. Um, so apologies for that in advance. And what I will do is well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll copy these lyrics. I suppose you want to give credit to uh, the source of the lyrics. Uh, scroll down a little bit. Um, so music ma music's match, credit to them. Um, and uh, so sole, a sole songwriter credited here is, is Andrew Eldritch himself, so not co-written, or doesn't appear to me. So um, I know Andrew Eldritch puts a great deal into his lyrics, and um, they are not, um, they are quite oblique, uh, which is great, you know, oblique lyrics are good. You know, and what I find interesting is what I like about all forms of art really is that there's what the artist intended and there's the effect that it has on the um, the audience of the art. Um, so people can interpret things not necessarily in the way that they're intended, but in a whole range of ways. And I think that's all part of the artwork, you know. Um, so it's not necessarily it's not we're not being nerdy and, and talking about the, you know, the precise meaning that Andrew Eldritch had in his head when he wrote this song but talking about you know what it what the connotations bring up for the listener uh me in this case let's see if i need to have a swig of water so the start of this song i find the lyrics more difficult to interpret but as it goes on <clears throat> it kind of makes more sense to me okay so Alice pressed against the wall so she can see the door. I always used to think it was so she can see the dawn, so she can see the door. In case the laughing strangers crawl and crush the petals on the floor. Now, I don't really have much of an idea of what that means, but aren't they beautiful? Isn't that, you know, lovely poetic um, stuff? I'm going to say that again. Alice pressed against the wall so she can see the door. In case the laughing strangers crawl and crush the petals on the floor. It's lovely, isn't it? Alice in her party dress, she thanks you kindly, so serene. She needs you like she needs her tranks to tell her that the world is clean. So she's serene, but only because she's taking drugs. Um, and we don't know if they're prescription drugs or street drugs, but tranks. So, you know, probably diazepam or some form of that. Uh, which is a drug prescribed for anxiety. So she needs them to tell her that the world is clean. So what do we mean by clean? Clean is kind of another word for, often for clear, isn't it? Um, a clear, a clear meaning, you know. So, um, so I think it's, um, and again we we kind of we're moving into as we as we go forward. We're talking about things being defined and precise. So to promise her a definition tell her where the rain will fall tell her where the sh sun shines bright and tell her she can have it all today so what we're getting a sense here is that Alice is somebody that suffers with anxiety and has a very strong need to know what's happening you know not a great tolerance of uncertainty um, and also a fear, as a fear of, you know, the, the future and things that might happen not coming out to her liking. So, so she wants to be told what's going to happen and she wants to be told that it's all OK. Uh, so tell her she can have it all. Now I'm going to talk about what this might mean psychologically in a, in a moment. Um, so pass the crystal, spread the tarot, in illusion comfort lies. The safest way, the straight and narrow, no confusion, no surprise. Okay, so when he's talking about crystal there, I mean, that could be any reference to kind of new age, um, you know, crystals. Um, or it could be crystal ball. Um, spread the tarot, so tarot cards, a form of divination. 
So in illusion, comfort lies. So it seems like uh, there's a sense in this song that uh, a lack of belief in tarot, um, that tarot is just an illusory um, way of finding comfort because um, the sense of knowing what's going to happen can bring can bring you comfort, even if it's not true. Um, but what the writer's saying is, I don't, I don't go along with any of that shit. The safest way is the straight and narrow. No confusion, no surprise. So don't bother with all that kind of tarot and uh, fortune telling, crystal ball gazing bollocks. Um, best ways to live to live your life um, without expectations, tolerating uncertainty. Um, so no confusion, no surprise. So you can't be um, if you don't have an expectation. Uh, then you won't be surprised, I guess. But then I guess if you don't know what's going to happen, everything's going to be a surprise. But yeah, let's not let's not get too mired in in that one. Um, <clears throat> so Alice in her party, in her party. So it starts off with party dress. Now it's party dressed to kill. Uh, she thanks the typo there. She thanks you, turns away. She needs you like she needs her pills to tell her that the world's okay. She needs you like she needs her pills. So the pills are going back to these tranks again. Um, or maybe we're talking about some other substance. Sometimes pills refers to ecstasy. Um, who knows? It probably, it probably doesn't really make a material difference to the to the song. Um, but the fact that she needs you like she needs her pills. So she wants reassurance from people as well as from uh, divination, trying to find out what the future holds and from anti-anxiety medication uh, or, or uh, illicit uh, anti uh, illicit substances that, that reduce anxiety to tell uh, she needs you like she needs her pills to tell her that the world's okay she wants to know that the world's okay she needs to that reassurance to promise her a definition tell her where the rain will fall tell her where the sun shines bright and tell her she can have it all today today Alice don't give it away not quite sure what the don't give it away is maybe don't don't give away your power um don't give away your autonomy don't give away your ability to make decisions maybe um to external things like medication or other people okay so why why am i as a psychotherapist wanting to to talk about this song well, obviously, anxiety disorders of, of various kinds is something that, that I work with a lot, um, including uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which comes under the, the umbrella of anxiety disorders. And reassurance seeking is often something that perpetuates anxiety among the people that suffer with anxiety. Um, and there's something known as safety behaviors which i've touched on in some other videos um so reassurance seeking is a safety behavior um and there are a number of different safe potential safety behaviors talking psychologically um a safety behavior might sound like a good thing you know safety behavior might be like putting your seatbelt on when you get in the car but that's not what we mean a safety behavior is uh something that that we do to try and mitigate anxiety that actually um, perpetuates the anxiety. So we, we do it because we, um, on some degree, it helps, but it's like a temporary fix. And uh, it means that the problem continues. So let me explain that. Um, so this goes along the theory that, and I've talked about this in another video, I can't remember which one, that uh, if we keep doing stuff, um, that we're anxious about um inevitably we will stop being anxious about it okay so i'll give you an example um public speaking okay which is a lot of people's bete noir um but if if you if you have an anxiety about public speaking but you were made against your will to uh give uh, a presentation every day for five years uh, to an audience of fifty thousand. Um, <laughs> it would either kill you <laughs> or you you would stop being anxious 
Um, because if we, because anxiety tends to come from, or often be associated with unfamiliarity. Uh, so if we do something, if we do something all the time, we don't get anxious about cleaning our teeth. Generally speaking, some people probably do. Some of you will probably message me in the comments and say, oh, "I get anxious about cleaning my teeth." Um, we get anxious about things that we don't do that often um, because they're new, they're different, they're unfamiliar, they're scary, um, and we're scared of what's unfamiliar. So um, what we do to try and adapt to these things in life is a whole range of things. Um, for example, um, if we've got to do public speak, public speaking, we might do what ICE does and take some diazepam, um, or we might use alcohol, or we might do, it might be some um, very kind of unique and idiosyncratic personal behaviour um like we might stick our uh, stick our hands in a pocket or we might fiddle with our earlobes you know it could be anything you know uh, people will do um in the world of body language um uh what do they call it? i wasn't going to talk about that so it says i've surprised myself with my own thinking um adapters so one of the things that in in uh, the the practice of and theory of body language is that uh, there are different kinds of movements that we do. Some are indicators. Um, some are, you know, some gestures that we make are, uh, for example, like pointing in the direction of something, um, you know, uh, that kind of gesture. And then others are adapters, which are kind of ways to release some of the nervous energy um, uh, or um, release discomfort and that kind of thing. So. Anything we do to, apart from just practice, anything we do to mitigate or reduce anxiety in a situation stops us fully experiencing and feeling the anxiety of that situation. And it's only through experiencing the anxiety of the situation and moving through it that we stop being anxious. So if we use a safety behavior, um, and it will give us some degree of comfort, but and it will reduce the anxiety. Great, I think. But doing that stops you getting over the anxiety. So you will always be anxious. Uh, so if you if you always, when you do your public speaking, you always carry your lucky charm with you. Um, if you lose your lucky charm that day, you're going to be in bits. You know, you're going to be hugely anxious. But if you never use a lucky charm and you never use tranquilizers and you never, you know, use kind of, you know, gestures or movements or little tricks to try and reduce your anxiety and you allow yourself to feel the anxiety, feel the fear and do it anyway. And you keep doing the thing, you will move through the anxiety and uh, back out to the other side, you know, through to the other side. Sorry. Um, so. This is, you know, as a as a psychotherapist, this is how I, I kind of look at this song now. I see Alice, Alice is somebody that suffers with anxiety and the way that she deals with this is a number of safety behaviors. One is medication. So when you suffer with, when you take medication, I mean, I'm not knocking medication for anxiety, by the way, or depression or anything else. Um, all has its place, sometimes essential. Um, and, but if if somebody is you know particularly if somebody's functioning reasonably well you know kind of um but they they have you know a degree of anxiety maybe in, in one aspect of their life that they want to work on um then um it might be and that anxiety is, is moderate you know it's probably better not to medicate it and to overcome it by working through it and uh, allowing yourself to feel the anxiety, not using these mitigating safety behaviours. You know, that's that's the, so so don't take this as a, a video saying you should never do things to make yourself feel better when you're anxious, because, you know, it's human and, and that's what we do. But in some cases, the things that we do to make ourselves feel better um, stop us moving through the problem and out the other side so that we always have the anxiety um, rather than the anxiety reducing. So. So Alice is using medication. Um, she's uh, using other people in some way or an, or another. Um, might be through reassurance seeking, probably. And I'm going to talk a lot more about reassurance seeking in a in a second. Um, divination, um, wanting to you know wanting them to have a crystal ball and 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 spread the tarot. 
um, wants to know, you know, where the rain will fall. Uh, rather than being able to live life um, in a confident way, thinking, well, what, you know, whatever happens, I'll deal with it in one way or another. Yeah, bad, bad things can happen. Shit can happen. Happens to everybody. There's nothing we can do to prevent that. Uh, it doesn't actually help to know that that's that's coming in advance. You know, I'm confident in myself that I can deal with most things. And if something so bad happens that, you know, I can't really deal with it, then, well, what could I have done anyway? So so that is essentially what I think the, the song is about. And I want to just sort of specifically talk um, a bit more about uh, OCD, because uh, that's something that I work with a lot. So retroactive jealousy is a form of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is where I, I always feel the need to put in my, my little kind of a uh, brief rant is that um, there are three components to obsessive compulsive disorder. One is uh, obsess being obsessive. <laughs> you can guess what's coming next. Uh, so obsession is to do with thinking. Also mental images like pictures in your head. Uh, uh, compulsive is to do with actions. Uh, so the actions, so they're the safety behavior. So for example, somebody that's got obsessive compulsive disorder and it's focused on contamination so maybe you know they have an anxiety when they touch a door handle that's been touched by other people they think oh god you know i'm going to be picking up bacteria from from this and then that causes them anxiety the compulsion is to wash their hands so when they wash their hands the anxiety goes away but only in the short term and then it comes back because next time they touch a door handle it would probably be even worse Okay, um, so I'm going to come on to the mechanism a bit more first. I've got slightly ahead of myself, um, but just to say that the, the third part of OCD is the disorder part. Okay, because um, people say things like, oh, I'm a bit OCD because I stir my tea three times anti-clockwise or, you know, I like um, I like to have my CDs in a certain order. Um, it's only um, it's only OCD when it's causing you or the people around and all the people around you a huge amount of distress that makes it a disorder. So everybody is probably a little bit obsessive and everybody is probably a little bit compulsive to you know to greater or lesser degrees. Um, but it's only a disorder when it reaches such a stage that it turns your life into you know often a living hell. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is is a really serious mental health condition is kind of often brushed off as something that's in mild you know especially when people say things like oh i've got a bit of ocd uh it's a bit like when people say oh everybody's a bit autistic no they're not <laughs> um ocd is you know is where it's reached the point of a disorder it's not the point of just being a little bit obsessive and a little bit compulsive it's where it's uh it's uh causing you horrible symptoms and horrible effects okay so so the the obsessive part is the, let's going back to the door handle. The obsessive part is the you touch the door handle and you're thinking, oh God, I've got these germs on my hand. And maybe what you probably do is you, you probably, um, somebody that's got that anxiety, they, they, um, they would probably hold their hand in a, in a particular way so that it doesn't touch anything else. You know, they don't want to, you know, the hand that's such a door handle, they don't want to touch it with their other hand because then, you know, that would that would create the anxiety that the contamination's on both hands now. It's even worse. Or they, they wouldn't want to kind of scratch, scratch their face with the hand that's touched the door handle because that hand feels, you know, it's got germs on, it's dirty, it's contaminated. And there's a burning desire to do something about that, to take the anxiety away. And the, so normally that's wash your hands. Um, and which is a rational thing to do if you really have got contamination on your hands, but um, this is to the point of an extreme. It's always with the OCD. It's always to, to a point of an extreme. And then um, they'll wash their hands. You know, they can't wait to wash their hands. They'll be thinking. They might be um, with friends walking somewhere, but they'll be thinking, "Oh, when can I wash my hand? When can I wash my hand?" And then they wash their hands and they feel, oh, thank God for that. I feel better now. I'm okay. Like, and then uh, it'll happen again worse the next time. And and the reason it does that is because of uh, because the re the the act of the compulsion of washing your hand is a safety behaviour. Um, and um, uh, so but similar to the other example, really. I suppose, but what I was going to talk about reassurance seeking, wasn't I? So reassurance seeking. This happens a lot with. Uh, retroactive jealousy so retroactive jealousy in a nutshell is where people have uh, distress not necessarily jealousy um, often more it's about feelings of disgust or anxiety anxiety is at the bottom of all these things and uh, this is related to their partner's romantic and or sexual 
history. So somebody with um, retroactive jealousy will have an inkling of, uh, you know, um, a little bit about their partner's romantic or sexual history. They might know that they they lived, uh, they lived with this this one guy for five years and they might know that they they had a one night stand with a um a mutual friend at such and such a time and they will feel really bad about that they'll feel a lot of disgust and they will get very curious and they'll um they'll want to ask questions and seek out more information so what they often actually do is like internet stalk these ex-partners to find out more about them or they'll ask their partner you know you know that thing with um so and so, so and so, back in nineteen sixty-seven. Um, well, you know, did, what did you, you know? Did you actually have sex? Or did you, was it just foreplay? Or you know, and um, and then the partner will, uh, if the partner answers, or they get the information they want through seeking it out online, they will experience temporary reassurance, and then their mind will start to work on it again. Okay, well, if you didn't have uh, actual sex with him what foreplay did you do you know did you did you do oral sex and uh, and they'll think about that and that will really worry them and upset them and they'll disgust them and then they'll come back with a question about that and the whole thing goes on and on and on so one of the first things we do with people that come to us for help with retroactive jealousy is we say look you've got to stop seeking the reassurance you've got to stop internet stalking or looking in your partner's diary um which is a breach of privacy as well and you've got to stop asking these questions um, because uh, by perpetuating the compulsions, you're maintaining the illness and setting up the next cycle, and it will go on and on and on and on. So that's what we call reassurance seeking. But reassurance seeking comes into other forms of anxiety as well. Okay, and Alice is reassurance seeking. This is what the tarot is. Now, I'm not knocking people that use tarot. Um, some people, are, uh, so a lot of Christians are really scared of tarot, aren't they? I think if you do tarot, it's like you, you know, you're dancing with the devil. Um, I, I, tarot is great. You know, I think it's a great, excellent um, tool. Um, really interesting as well from a psychological point of view because it's got all the Jungian archetypes in there. Um, and you know, divination. I, I don't have an issue with. Um, I think it's absolutely fine. Um, people people do it um and it can be very useful i think um and sometimes it can, can be you know i'm not saying it always works i think it could produce some red herrings um it's how you interpret the cards and these things as well um so it's a whole complex area so i'm not going to get too much into that but i just want to say really that i'm not i'm not saying that divination uh is in any way a bad thing in itself but it's how it's used okay so if you're doing it um when you have a decision to make, um, you know, when you're at a crossroads in life and you want to, you know, just see um, if you can get a little bit more guidance. And maybe that guidance comes from external forces and sources and maybe that guidance actually just comes from our unconscious and the tarot and the divination is a way of accessing our inner wisdom. Um, again, big subject, I want to get into that. But if you're doing it every day, um, and you can't make any decisions, even small ones, without uh, using divin divination. And I like the example that they they give here. It would tell her where the rain will fall and tell her where the sun shines bright. Well, obviously that's kind of allegorical. I'm sure she's not using it like a weather forecast because she could just use a weather forecast. But you know, the rain, you know, symbolizes you know things that you know bad stuff happening. The sun, good stuff happening. You and and this anxiety that you need to know. You know, you can't deal with the with the uncertainty. So, a lot of anxiety is caused by our inability to tolerate uncertainty. And a lot of anxiety conditions are perpetuated by the very things that we might try and do uh, to make us feel better, which, which is a cruel irony, really. Um, and this is why when somebody comes, you know, for therapy, around anxiety or um so retroactive jealousy is a form of obsessive compulsive disorder um a manifestation of it um we tell people to stop doing the very things that they think are their lifelines so you know it comes you know it can seem awfully cruel um but actually what we're doing is helping people to get free of this stuff you know um but like getting off a getting off of a drug um so tell me what you think you know um am i right 
off the mark. You know, maybe Andrew Eldridge has given an interview somewhere and explained exactly what Alice is about. Um, and it's nothing to do with what I'm talking about. And that's fine. I don't, I, you know, I don't mind it. I'm, I'm, I always raise these interpretations very tentatively. Um, I, I think this is a good illustration of that process with an anxiety disorder, whether that's what Andrew Eldridge intended or not. Um, but I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that. Whether you know, um, I'm sure, um, you know, there, there are a lot of fans out there that know masses more than I do about about Andrew Eldridge, the Sisters of Mercy, the song, everything. And if you know stuff, um, please tell me, put it in the comments. I love that when people enlighten me. Um, or if you have a different view, um, or if you have any thoughts or questions about the psychological sort of aspects of this that I've described with these conditions, these anxiety disorders. And uh, I hope that was of interest. So do check out the other videos. Um, and if you want to help us help other people, help people that have retroactive jealousy in their partners, um, you can do that just by supporting this channel, just by watching till the end. Not not kind of clicking off now, because you can tell by my voice that I'm you know coming to a conclusion. Um, by sticking right to the very end, um, that helps the uh, the the YouTube algorithm um, promotes this channel. And when it promotes this channel, it promotes all our stuff on Retro Jealousy that helps people. So you can do something helpful for other people just by listening for a couple more seconds because I am racing to the end. And thank you. And, and subscribing and all that stuff, uh, commenting, all that stuff, really, really helpful. And I will see you in the next one. So remember, I'm... I'm um, about to do a video i don't know when i'm going to do this it's a bit of an epic one that I've, that's in the planning stage um that that uh talks a little bit about um possibly there's the psychology of mr eldritch himself and with that on that note i shall uh say goodbye